this is season five, episode four of Beyond the Illusion. Thanks for joining us. If you've listened to any of the episodes in this season so far, then you're probably already aware that Tiana has recently completed writing her first book, which is exciting news. And in today's conversation, we are going to talk to her about the book and what that journey of writing it was like. I finished reading the book a couple weeks ago, and I've already referred back to it several times. And each time I do, I get more out of it. I just love what her guide, Will, has to say on so many important topics throughout the book. So now, let's go to that conversation with Tiana Roser and myself, Tim Howe. I'm here to talk about your book. Awakening Transformation. And I know there's a subtitle, but I, f- I forget exactly what it is. Can you tell us what it is? A Beginner's Guide to Becoming Your Higher Self. Yes, that's it. Yeah, I really love that. And, you know, you and I have been friends, you know, for several years, and, and we talk about books, and, and we've even interviewed a lot of authors. And I always wondered, like, mm-hmm. why you never wrote your own book. Can you just kind of tell me why you went ahead and decided to write the book now? Yeah, it's kind of a funny story. The beginning of the year, like in February, like you will remember and people who listen will remember that I've had some like random or seemingly random health stuff that was going on since 2019. And pretty much it uh, it's under control, but I always still kind of like wondered and, you know, what exactly was that? Because it wasn't ever really for sure diagnosed what it was. And so I had a friend who told me about this sort of medical intuitive that she had gone to and had really good results, um, who was like really affordable. Because when I'd looked into medical intuitives before, they were like really expensive, the ones that other people had recommended to me. So I never sought that out. So I was like, oh, I might as well give it a shot. You know, it's like an hour long session for like $75 for an hour. It's really (laughs) reasonable. And so we were talking, you know, different health stuff. And then, and then the time, you know, I was done, she answered all of my questions about the health stuff and I still had time left. And she was like, you know, what else do you want to know about? And I hadn't, I didn't really think of anything. And I said, well, what does spirit want me to know? And she said, oh, you know, they, they said that you need to write a book and it needs to come out <laughs> right away or, you know, hopefully this year or, you know, maybe in a year or two at the most. And I just laughed because I've been told that so many times over the years. I mean, this my whole spiritual journey, I'd been told that. And I had tried a number of times before to write a book, even years ago, like in 2011. So 10 years ago, I had gone on this trip to Spain and I had even booked out this little cute little Spanish villa in this cute little city up in the mountains that overlooked the ocean and just was like, that's going to be when I, you know, write this book. And I even told people on the plane <laughs> that were sitting next to me that I was writing this book and, you know, told different people and so forth. And then, you know, when it came down to it, I got to a certain point and then I just felt stuck. And that's what had happened to me before. I had several different versions of books before. And I, I think there's always a point where I started to question myself, like, is this book really necessary? You know, aren't there other books out there like this? And I don't know if, you know, is this that important? And I would just kind of give up. But the way that this intuitive had said it to me was that there were certain souls that I have soul agreements with. And this book needs to come out because it's overdue because I hadn't been meeting my soul agreement. And that sort of flipped it in my mind because before it was like just you know, about me and like, you know, what do I want to put out and, you know, then doesn't need to be out there. And now it was like, oh my gosh, I I have, you know, sort of promised these other souls that, (laughs) that we would connect in this way and I'm not fulfilling my end of the deal. And so it totally changed the way I was looking at it. And the other thing that really helped me too was she said, oh, it doesn't need to be a big book, you know, like a hundred pages or so. And that kind of changed the way I was looking at it in my book, because I think a lot of people who try to write books have this issue where you keep thinking like, oh, it should be more complete and more complete. And it's just like, 
ongoing. It never feels complete. Like you're trying to like create this like masterpiece or, you know, perfection, but instead it was this idea, she said, where this kind of overview thing where I could, you know, give people a lot of different pieces, but I don't have to go into each one of them in depth. And so it just totally changed. And so um, after that, I was like, okay, let me give that a shot. And then of course, also I've been such an avid international traveler for the last, you know, over a decade hitting like five new countries every year. And then, you know, since the pandemic, haven't traveled out of the country at all. And so the blessing on the other end of that was how I had this time to really focus because before I was going for like a month in the spring away and a month in the fall. And so not having this like long chunk of time to really focus on one thing, which is important when you're going to write a book. And so for all of these reasons, it kind of like finally came together. And uh, when I was going back, I was like, well, I had these half written books. Let me go back and see if there's anything I can pull from these, you know, in my Google Docs or whatever. And the crazy thing was I found this message in one of those half written books. There was like a channeled message from my spirit guide, um, Will. And that whole journey with my spirit guide, Will, is talked a lot about in the book where he said the same thing the intuitive had said. He said that I had these soul, and I don't know, I I had totally forgotten it. And this this was written, you know, over a decade ago. And there it was, like, almost exactly what she said. So that was, like, all the confirmation that I needed from that point forward. And I just kind of checked in with my guides, and they really encouraged me that the book comes first, everything comes second. And so I I went on this, you know, like about an hour a day writing schedule, which I'd never been that focused and determined with it before, I think, over a period of time. And so somehow this time, all the pieces fell into place together where, yeah, the writing part just flowed and I was able to get that done this year. Wow. You know, a couple of things I want to say there first is um, congratulations, by the way, by for Thank completing you. the book. Yeah. I'm sure it's a big, you know, process and a lot of work. Also, the other thing is I've read a lot of books. You know, I, I'm a big reader and always have been since I was a kid. And with this book, it's really good. You know, you mentioned this earlier too. You said that Spirit said you weren't supposed to go into depth on the topics like a uh, real deep, you know, and you don't. And and I love that because you cover so much in the book, but yet it doesn't feel like you really read that much because it's really not a super thick book or anything. Um, but I do appreciate, you know, all the different topics that you covered. And the other thing is it's written in this voice because I know you, you know, I know you pretty well. And it's written in a way that's, it's like this other person came out of you. And that's just really fascinating to read a book and be like, hey, I know this person, but it doesn't seem like I know her at all. <laughs> That's interesting that you say that that way. Um, a lot of I've got a lot of feedback where people really appreciated the casual tone of the book, you know, mm-hmm. just kind of like speaking like, because that's how I feel like it's speaking as a friend versus as an authority. And I think that that was something early on in my practice that I had struggled with at first when I started teaching Reiki classes and I'm like, I'm the teacher. And so there's this like, and people would project stuff onto you as the teacher, like, Oh, you're the Reiki teacher. And at that time, now I don't drink alcohol, but at that time I did. And when, and one of my Reiki students, it was like the Super Bowl party. And she ran into me, she goes, Oh, you're my Reiki teacher. And she was surprised I was drinking a glass of wine. <laughs> and I remember just or coming into class and I wasn't wearing all white. Cause I actually usually am wearing at least one, piece of black. And um, somebody's like, you're the teacher. I thought you were supposed to wear all white. It just, you know, and it Mm -hmm. used to affect me because, you know, and that's why I would attract this kind of situation, I guess, is because I had to learn to let go of that and just laugh and, you know, whatever people's ideas and preconceptions, not to let it affect me being my authentic self. But I did initially when I was, before I was trying to like be whatever I thought, you know, people expected of me, And early on, thankfully, learn, no, I don't want to do things that way. And this is my business, or in this case, this is my book, and I can uh, create it in whatever way I want. And I want to just be my authentic self. And so even when I had, I'd written the first draft, and I had a few people read it, one person's edit uh, was kind of taking out all the little <laughs> expressions. I, you know, I, I know in somewhere in there I say "mind blown!" exclamation point or hmm. things like this, and that's 
that's how I talk. That's how I think. Yeah. And uh, but they they'd crossed it out like, oh, you know, you don't need to say that. Or, um, but I was like, no, that's the way that I think it, and that's the way that I would say it. And I'm so glad that I kept those things in because so many people told me like how much they appreciate that. And I think like those old rules that used to apply about the way that you write a book or the way that you are professional or whatnot those don't apply so much anymore. You get to choose. And so, yeah, I wrote it like the way that I talk, uh, in my opinion. I think it's interesting that you said it doesn't sound like me because so many other people have told me like, oh, yeah, it's like it's just like you were sitting there talking to me. But I could see you mean like maybe a different side of, you know, yeah. it's still it's super casual. Like the way that I express everything is super casual. Like somebody's like talking to you, telling you a story, but maybe it's just different the way that you've perceived me like on the podcast or whatnot. Yeah. I mean, it does, it has your voice for sure. Like you were saying, like with the little expressions and stuff and that does it, it you know, that does give it its own little charm. Like you're reading and it's like, oh yeah, like she's really talking to me right now. So I'm glad, I'm actually glad you kept that in there too. But yeah, like I was saying earlier, I'm sure writing a book is a huge process. So can you tell us about what you learned through that process of writing the book? Yeah. So, I mean, so one of the things is what I had just mentioned already, which was like the things that held me back before, the way that I might doubt or question myself, you know, is this going to be good enough or who am I to write a book or whatnot? When the tables turn, when I was focusing on the people that I was, I meant to help the people that I have soul agreements with, then all of that stuff just kind of went away. And so I think there's like a wonderful lesson there for everyone, as far as like, we're all souls that have a unique essence, and we have our own unique gifts to share. And I think so many light workers hold back because of those doubts in themselves. But instead of like focusing on that, if we would focus on the people that we're here to help, then it helps us to overcome that, the bigger picture. And even not like in a like grandiose way, because we're all here to help each other. And so that's kind of the idea with the soul contracts is how much I'm learning or growing through this process and then who I can help. And so just by focusing on those that you're here to help or that you have soul agreements with can really kind of overcome our own smaller personal setbacks. But also things that kind of are a big part of your soul plan keep coming back. (laughs) So if you're avoiding something that you're supposed to do that you came in to do as a soul, it'll probably keep showing up until, you know, spirit keeps trying to bring it back. I mean, one of those things actually for me was moving to Austin because boyfriend before who I call Max in the book, um, Mm -hmm. and we had moved um, from Hawaii to Boston. And then we had made plans to move to Austin and he decided he wanted to stay in Boston. And I decided like, oh, well, I've never been to Austin. I don't know anybody there. I don't have a job there. I'm going to move to Seattle where I have family and I have a job lined up. And so I didn't come to Austin, but eventually life brought me back to Austin anyway, because I feel like, oh, I'm really supposed to be here. I feel so at home. This place feels so resonant to my energy. And so it came back around for me again. And that's like this book. Somehow in my mind, I totally forgot, like I said, this message that Will told me about writing the book and other messages, like I said, from other psychics years ago had told me the same thing, but I conveniently forgot because it was uncomfortable. And so, you know, that's what we do a lot of times is we sort of let that uh, fall back in our consciousness because, oh, it's too uncomfortable to face, but then spirit will keep bringing it back until you finally do what you came in to do. And then also what we were just saying about, I think it's important just to be our authentic self. And for some people that will be to be kind of more formal or whatnot. And that's fine because that's the way that they are. Some people are more reserved or some people kind of have that air of authority about them. But, you know, anyone who's taken any of my Reiki classes will also know that my style is like sharing versus teaching, I feel like I just love to share all the things that really help me and coming from that perspective versus like, this is what I know. And this is what you should know. I don't, I don't come from that way. And so just by being my authentic self and speaking in, you know, the voice that feels true to me, then the right 
people will find it. The right people will resonate. And that's what I found my Reiki classes as well. Because here in Austin, I mean, compared to other cities, every other person (laughs) teaches Reiki, it seems like. Like a lot of people are Reiki practitioners in here. And so you would think like, oh, well, there's like too much competition. Nobody's ever going to come to me. But it's just not true. It's because we each have our unique essence and expression. And when we feel safe enough and trust that we can be that in the world, then we are coming from our highest vibration and being our most authentic self will make us magnetic to the right people, the perfect fit for that. And so I really encourage lightworkers just to put themselves out there. I know how scary it is. I know just different steps along the way, like this podcast, <laughs> when it, the, the time when it like finally dawned on me, like, oh my God, I have some really personal stories on here that anyone, any stranger anywhere in the world could hear and know these things about me. And, you know, that makes you very vulnerable. And, you know, putting out in this book, like people who know me, more personally, you know, know that I have this spirit guide, but, you know, to put it on, on paper that I talk to a non-physical being, <laughs> you know, in other lifetimes, that would be enough to get hauled away to some institution. And so there's always this kind of fear, I think, for so many of us that probably comes a good deal, you know, some from this life, but probably from other lifetimes where we were outcast or heretics or burned at the stake or all of these things for expressing these kind of non-conformist type of ideas and belief systems. But by putting myself out there, people it helps other people to put themselves out there. Like I've been surprised some of the people that reached out to me like in my network or my friends and family that told me that they read my book that I never knew had any spiritual leanings or interest at all before. And I don't know, maybe they've quietly had that and not felt safe to express it. Or maybe they were just like, huh, I wonder what kind of book Tiana wrote. And they went and bought it. And then maybe it opened something up for them. But it's been really fun, really cool to do that. And I think that so it's important for us to kind of get over our own doubts and personal fears. Stop playing small. That's like been a big one for me for some years now that I keep trying to stop playing small. I think that part of that is from my upbringing, you know, being half Japanese and also in Hawaii, the Asian influence, which is to be more humble. And it's not about you, but you can take that too far where you're not living your highest potential because you're not stepping into bigger shoes because you're like, this is enough. Oh, this is fine. This is kind of what I used to do. Oh, this is enough. This is fine. Again, if you don't just focus on yourself and like, oh, all of my needs are taken care of. But if you think about like, oh, but maybe there are others who could really benefit from something that I share, then that can help push you to put yourself out there more. You mentioned that Focusing on on the other person is what really what helped you you know get through this and I I have to say like as I read the book you could tell you could really feel that you were doing your best to give this information to people that could really genuinely help them and there were so many things in there that it was just said in a way that it clicked with me and I was like yeah that's right like. I, I do need to do those things because it's almost like a, a like a guide. It's like a manual to to help you become a better person, really. And I love that because I'm really all about that. Like I've been on this kick with other books, like you know, reading about like excellence and peak performance and all this stuff. And it's so funny because like half of the things that you recommend, they also recommend just with different language, you know, they're talking Mm -hmm. about it from a science point of view, but you're taking these same concepts and you're putting them in a way that's like very relatable and very easy to do in your life, like really simple things that can make a huge difference. You know, just for example, you mentioned like the importance of, of dreams and how your guide will also talks about like how you can, you know, start to journal your dreams and, and it's the way it's the subconscious way of communicating with you. You know, I have actually started doing that and it's, it's amazing. Again, you know, I had lost touch with that practice, but once I read that in your book again, I started doing it and 
it was just incredible how how much information can come through one dream and it's like it's just it's just been amazing so and that, that's just one thing you know there were so many things in there that i either had done or tried at one point and just you know stopped doing but then once i read about it again in the way that you say it it just makes you want to go back to it and try it again that's something that other people had said to me too. You know, it's, even though I have the subtitle "A Beginner's Guide for Becoming Your Higher Self," a lot of my friends that read it are people who have been on the spiritual path for a while, and they're not beginners. It's not just for beginners because people would say, like, "Oh, I knew about some of these tools, but it's the way that you put it together, or it's the way that you expressed it that made it click for me." Or I just feel like one of my gifts is I, you know, me, I get really excited about things. And I just feel like when I get excited about something, I can express it in a way that gets other people excited about it too. And when I was little, and so this is just an example of how, you know, what you think are your weakness can be your strength. When I was really little, I would get so excited about things and then I'd get embarrassed because people, I mean, this was a little, little girl too. People would kind of laugh at how excited I would get about things. And then, so I learned, you know, and I talk about this in the book, I kind of learned not to get so excited because, Hey, it's not cool. Right. And then you go, you go through like um, middle and high school and you want to be cool. So you, I don't care about anything and you know, all of this, but um, now I embrace it again. Like, Oh, my, my excitement, my enthusiasm, that's my spark. And hopefully, like I can spark that in someone else. Because when you think about the idea of being on the spiritual journey, that sounds kind of like disciplined and cold and difficult. And certainly there is all of that. <laughs> and I mentioned to you before, like, I, I don't know if it's going to be my next book, but one of my books will be finding the light through the dark, all of the difficult parts of my journey. But this kind of light fun, playful <laughs> energy that I have, I think is sort of infused in there so that people can see like, no, this can be really exciting and fun as well to to grow and to look within it yourself. You know, there's just something I've always wanted to ask you and, and let me preface it with this. So, you know, there've been a couple of times where we've been talking to Shannon and and she'll refer to you as a spiritual warrior. And, you know, I think that's the perfect description for you because you're so committed to to this path and to who you are really and anyone that knows you they they know that about you like they know this is who you are it's just so different from most people because most people don't don't put themselves out there like that they don't present themselves in a real genuine way like that and so i want to always wanted to ask you this and and it came up during the book too so i wrote it down and i i I don't know exactly how to say it, but it's kind of like this question, like, you know, the matrix where, where he says, you know, you you have this choice, you can take the blue pill or you can take the red pill. And so my question is kind of like to you, like, what do you think your life would have been like if you had taken the blue pill, like you hadn't decided to commit to the spiritual path like you did? What do you think your life would be like? Yeah, I think it would be like a lot of people's lives that you know you see where you are going through the motions and you achieve things, but something is nagging inside that feels unfulfilled and you can't understand why because you are making the good money and you have the family and, and the things that you always thought you wanted, but yet something feels empty inside. And I think that, you know, there's people that I know that they, the way that they deal with that is that after work, they have two glasses of wine every night, or that's a lot of people's lives. And so I I really do think that that's, that would have been mine. It would have been an okay life from, you know, the objective perspective, but from my soul's perspective, it would have not been fulfilling at all. And it would not be my authentic self. I can definitely see how for that first chunk of my life, I was not my authentic self. And that's where the spark wasn't there. I mean, I could still get excited about things, but I wasn't being 
comfortable in my own skin. That's one of the big things that I really appreciate about who I am now is how comfortable I am in my own skin and all of these things, putting yourself out there helps you with that. It's super uncomfortable. (laughs) Like I said, just like, so like the book and then backtrack the podcast and then backtrack starting my own business. All of those things are ways that you have to put yourself out there that other people might not accept. But going through all of that kind of desensitizes you to other people's opinions of you, people who don't get you. Yeah, I just think that I'm so happy to be comfortable in my own skin. And that kind of freedom is the the real freedom. You know, the freedom isn't freedom to fly in your private jet anywhere in the world. The real freedom is wherever you go, there you are. And wherever you go, you can feel at ease and relaxed. And so there's no way that if I if I didn't do it at that point in my life, you know how I said things keep coming around. I think there's like such a strong push, strong drive by my soul. My soul came in to do certain things or my soul came in to grow in a certain way. And I constantly, that's what pushes me, that energy that you're talking about that I don't quite understand, but I, all I can say is that it, it comes from my soul. So I think my soul would have kept <laughs> pushing it in different ways so that it would be like impossible to ignore. Yeah. So my next question is, it's along the same lines. And uh, you do talk about this in the book a little bit where uh, you, you think you were working at a bookstore at one point and you found a book that talked about your work as spirituality or something along those lines. And mm-hmm. I guess my question is like, you know, we have all these kind of elaborate ways of thinking and, and looking at life and we put these elaborate ideas on everything. So even spirituality, like it's almost like there are certain guidelines for being what's considered a spiritual person, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm just wondering, like, what do you think of, of people who, who don't follow any of those guidelines, who, who don't, you know, meditate or, or, or do work on their chakras or anything like that that's considered spiritual, but they're just regular people. They're just everyday people. And I'm wondering, like, are those people spiritual too? Like, what are your ideas about that? What, what's your definition of spiritual? Yeah, see, I guess it's where I'm confused. It's like... You know, everyone's got this idea in their head of what spiritual is, but does it really have to be anything, you know? I think spiritual is having an awakened consciousness and being of certain vibration. And so in that way, you know, a vibration that is aligned with love, so their actions are a reflection of that love. People that hold a certain vibration, you can either sense or feel that light illuminating from them, right? And so they don't have to be somebody on a spiritual path, but they do have to be self-aware. There's people that are kind and loving, but not self-aware. And somebody might not do these practices like you know, have a formal meditation time or work on their chakras or go to yoga retreats or whatever, or or read books on spirituality. But if they are living their life from from love and and kindness and from self-awareness and they continue to grow and evolve uh, their awareness and who they are, then yeah, that's what I would consider being spiritual. It's not necessary to have a meditation practice uh, if you're living your life as a meditation, but it's hard to live your life as a meditation without kind of maybe making some separate time. But that's not to say it's not possible. I do think there's people that live like that. But I think, you know, for most people, just because of the way that the world is designed and what we're inundated with, you know, maybe if you're living like an indigenous person or you're living off the land, then it's easier because you're naturally in connection with nature and with the truth true essence and vibration and flow of things. But if you are working in a corporation or um, and you are consuming a lot of social media or watching TV or these things really pull us out of that alignment with spirit, that's why these types of practices are really helpful to bring us back into alignment. But yeah, so, so I think, um, yes, it's possible, but not that common if somebody doesn't do any type of spiritual practice. The part you're referring to in my book um, where, 
Yeah, I was managing a cafe, a Barnes and Noble bookstore, which was the Boston University bookstore. It was so busy because all the students would come in there and study and drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> and all my staff were um, college students and they were just, you know, just a little bit younger than me. And so all day long, I was just like running around, running around. It was super, super busy. But on my lunch break, that's when I'd have a chance to kind of walk around. And of course, I love books. So I was like, oh, I, you know, here I am in a bookstore. Let me look around and see. But yeah, that book that was called, I think it's called Work as Spiritual Practice. Like, so that there had been a point at that point, I felt super frustrated because I'd spend like nine or 10 hours running around all day as the manager at this bookstore. And then I get home and I'm like, oh, I can't wait to do my spiritual practice. But a lot of times I'd be exhausted. And I felt like, oh, just trying to survive. I think this is very common. People feel like just trying to survive through work. You know, I'm having to work all these hours just to survive. And then there's no time for my spiritual practice. And how am I ever going to be able to grow or evolve if I'm just putting all of my time and energy into survival? And so that book, Work as Spiritual Practice, shifted my perspective, realizing that everything can be spiritual practice. And so work, you know, rather than putting this false kind of separation between work time and spiritual practice, just by changing my focus and intention throughout the day at work and looking at every interaction with each person as a spiritual interaction, we're exchanging energy. How can I be of service just in my vibration? How can I learn something through the challenge that I was having with my boss? How can I, yeah, every single situation is an opportunity for me to see something about myself and grow. And that's what spiritual practice is. It's not just going and sitting quietly by yourself and meditating, or like I said, going on a yoga retreat. That's not just spiritual practice. All of your interactions throughout the day, everything that we do is spiritual practice if we bring awareness. So that goes back to what you're saying before. So it's, um, it's all about our awareness. I could go and do all of these things throughout the day and, and just kind of like a robot, like we become and we're just so busy and without any awareness, it doesn't grow me as a soul or I can be constantly aware and watching my reactions and reflecting on myself through that. And it's all spiritual practice. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like the the easiest kinds are like sitting by yourself and meditating and going into nature and those kind of things because you aren't really, you know, challenged or you aren't really um, triggered or anything in those scenarios. And so it's actually pretty awesome. But, you know, it's like the real work is, you know, when you are with your family or your friends and somebody says something that you don't agree with, whatever it is, you know, whatever scenario comes up in your life where you are tested, where you have to see like really truly what's inside of you at that point, you know, and that's where, you know, that's where aware, like you were saying, awareness and even growth happens. You know, there were several points during the reading of this book where I had like things come up in my consciousness that I hadn't thought of in a long time. And it was just so, so weird because, um, you know, the whole forgiveness section, I have to say the forgiveness section was like, that was pretty powerful. I think, you know, for, at least for me, that's a critical, that's a crucial piece, I think, of people's development. You know, the forgiveness thing brought up some memories that just out of nowhere, you know, just randomly. And, um, It was pretty moving, I have to say, and and I think Will even had like something about forgiveness that he says that really just hit home for me. I'm just wondering, where did you come up with these different, because I know there's like, it's almost like bullet points in the book, like these are the really the most important things that can help you accelerate your growth. Like how did you come across those, you know, those things or how did you narrow it down to those things? Yeah, that's the key that I was having a challenge with was editing it things down. Because again, I'd found at some point that I kept like adding more things and realizing that if I was going to keep doing that, then I was not going to achieve my goal of getting the book out this year. So I definitely left things out. But a, a lot of the things, so first of all, these are the things that constantly we come back to when I'm working with clients all the time. And clients will come in for hypnosis, for example, everything under the sun. I mean, I could have a 
people come in for a different issue every single day of the year and not repeat, you know, whether it's habits, whether, you know, so whether it's like things that are issues that are happening with their physical body or someone's like stop smoking or lose weight or whether it's emotional issues, there's a, you know, heartbreak over a breakup or anger issues or they're have anxiety or, you know, sadness or whatnot, it ends up coming back to, or phobias, it ends up coming back to these same core things, forgiveness and connecting with your inner child and embracing your shadow. These are like, this is core deep work. And how do I know about this? Because of my own journey, (laughs) before I became a practitioner, you know, when I first started on the spiritual journey and I quit my job and I moved to Boston and I was working for minimum wage at a cafe, um, but I had all this time to start doing this deep inner work that I realized um, needed to be done. And so these are all the things that help me. And so there are things that are very personal to me that I know are just foundational work. And I, I think on the spiritual journey, and I talk about this because I went through this myself, it, there's a lot of a lot of people that do what's called spiritual bypassing, which is where you avoid sort of, you know, there's the seven key chakras along our spine and the lower ones are more earthly things. And then the upper ones are more spiritual things. And then our heart connects spirit to matter, heaven to earth. It's all within us. And when you start on a spiritual journey and you kind of start to open these upper spiritual chakras and you experience these amazing, beautiful places and energy, and you just want to live there and and you don't want to come back down to your lower chakras where you feel like all the uncomfortable stuff is, that's called spiritual bypassing where, you know, it's those people, and I think we've talked about this before on the podcast, but it it bears repeating because I still, I see it being fairly prevalent where people are like good vibes only, you know, and they only want to focus on the love and light aspect and the idea, even the law of attraction stuff. A lot of times people are like, oh, I'm not going to allow that energy into my experience, but that doesn't actually really work. We have to face the lower stuff as well through love and compassion, those things transform through, you know, forgiveness, those things transform. So anyway, I think that these tools, they're sort of more these lower chakra things that we need to do. These are these chakras are sort of like a ladder, a stepping stone up, you know, to the seventh chakra, that's oneness, but then the root chakra, that's our real connection to earth. So we have to kind of go through all of these stepping stones. We can't skip over to the seventh step when you haven't done step one and step two. And so these are like really important foundational work that needs to happen on your spiritual journey. If you try to skip ahead, and I did, and I know other people do, you know, and you open and you receive all of this like high vibrational, big spiritual energy, then that big energy topples you over because you're like a tree that doesn't have a good root system. We have to have this lower root system, these lower chakras cleared and developed to be foundation for us to keep growing higher. These are the tools that I come back to over and over again. And so I thought, oh, it'd be really great just to have it in a book as a reference to people when people ask me, you know, what are some of the things that can help me? Very cool. Yeah. I, I think it's like um going to be one of those books that I probably read once a year, you know, just to kind of remind myself like, okay, these are the really, this is the real good stuff I need to like focus on now. Cause it is easy to kind of get, you know, go off in all these different directions. And since you did say that you kind of had to narrow it down, are there plans for you to write another book at some point? Oh, yeah. I was, <laughs> I've was. i always been told that I'm going to write a number of books. I've always been told that, you know, like I said, over the years. And now that I've gone through the process, uh, it'll be much easier. It is one of those things that at first it's like trying to figure out how to get it out and published and formatted and all of this stuff, you know, that kind of left brain stuff that I don't really like very much. At first, I was like, oh, you know, but then once you do it one time and you're like, oh, okay, and now I know who to go to, you know, for getting the cover done or how to, you know, do this or that. Absolutely. There'll absolutely be more books and there's more of my journey. And I imagine because, as you know, I have a strong push to constantly grow and evolve. 
my journey will keep evolving too. And so there'll be more to share as there should be as I keep going. But yeah, there's still a whole big chunk because that's sort of like spiritual awakening part one (laughs) when I quit my marketing business job and I opened up to spiritual, but there was like a big spiritual awakening part two that happened, you know, in 2015. And since then things that we've alluded to before, like meeting a twin flame, having my Kundalini awaken, going through a dark night of the soul. There's a lot of stuff there that I would like to cover in depth because more and more people are having those experiences now because of the time that we're in on the planet, because the vibration keeps shifting and we're going through a collective sort of dark night of the soul. And some more people need kind of resources so that when they're going through their individual dark night of the soul or when their Kundalini activates, or if they meet their twin flame, they will know how to get through that because I see other people that are going through that that are just kind of stuck in it right now and so to have gone through and be on the other side where I feel like an even better version of myself but I first had to go into the the depths of the darkness before I could you know really reclaim who I am in a higher sense that's probably going to be my next book. But then also I'd like to maybe go more in depth on any of these topics, whether it's past lives or whether it's Reiki or some of the things that I do. I have lots of experiences, my own, and also my clients' experiences and stories that might be helpful for people. Oh, that's great. Well, I, for one, will be uh, excited to read the next ones then when they come out. So, Can you please tell people where they can find your book and find out more about you if they want to do that? Yeah, I think although my my book's available through pretty much any kind of um, bookseller, I think the easiest place to find it would be on Amazon. You can just type in my name or you can type in Awakening Transformation and my book will pop up. You can have it in print or you could have it as an ebook. And then, of course, my my business is called Awakening Transformation. And so to find out any of my services or, you know, read my blog post or see other podcasts that I've been on, you can go to awakeningtransformation.com and find all of that stuff there. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, it's been fun chatting with you. Yeah. Thanks for coming on our podcast. We hope you come <laughs> thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond the Illusion. I'd like to say thank you very much to Tiana Roser for taking the time to talk with me and for sharing her gifts and knowledge with us. You can find Tiana's book on Amazon or on her website, awakeningtransformation.com. You can also find out more about the services that Tiana offers on her website as well. And just in case, here is the title of the book one more time. It's Awakening Transformation, A Beginner's Guide to Becoming Your Higher Self. And before we go, I'd like to say thank you to Casey Henson for creating the music we use on this podcast and to Tiana Roser for all the work she does to keep this podcast going. For more information about us or to access past episodes, please visit our website, beyondtheillusionpodcast.com. And you can find us on social media as well. And lastly, if you're enjoying this podcast, please leave a rating for us. This will help other people find us. Take care. See you. Oh